Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. This is Judge Stickleton on the record in Prime Court Technologies, case number 2311161. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. On the record, Mary Clemson of McGill, Laura Emery on behalf of the debtors. Your Honor, in the courtroom with me today are my partner, Darren Esmond, and my colleague, Michael Lombacher, and Dante Caban. Good afternoon. Also in the courtroom today is Bill Murphy, who is an M3 partner, Star Financial Advisor. Your Honor, we recently filed our second amended agenda. Does Your Honor have a copy? I was just handed a copy. Great. So turning to the agenda, I'd like to thank Your Honor for entering order prior to today on item 1B5. And which brings us to item 6, which is our request for a third interim cash management order with respect to the 345B waiver. We spoke to the U.S. trustee about this, and they have agreed to a further extension through October 18th, our next hearing. And I have a red line. Okay. Yes, please. And Your Honor, in the red line, you'll see that it's basically just changing the date and accounting for the second interim order. And we have updated this as well. But if Your Honor doesn't have any questions, we ask that you enter the order. Mr. Cudi, do you want to be heard? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Joseph Cudi for the United States trustee. Ms. Kansas is correct. We do consent to the further interim order, 345 relief. Okay. Thank you. We will get that entered. Thank you, Your Honor. Item 7 on the agenda is our request for conditional approval of the disclosure statement, as well as approval of proposed solicitation voting and noticing procedures, our proposed confirmation timeline, and the forms of solicitation and noticing procedures. We filed our initial plan of disclosure statement on September 8th at docket numbers 92 and 93. And since that time, we've been working with a number of parties to make adjustments, changes, and negotiate some resolutions to confirm validity rates, both in informal objections or comments and formal objections filed with the court. In particular, we've been working very, very closely with the U.S. Trustee's Office and the committee. And indeed, I think we've been working on the clock and got really down to the wire with the committee on this one. So I want to thank the U.S. Trustee's Office and the committee for working so cooperatively and quickly with us. We have incorporated some of these changes to an updated version of the plan of disclosure statement that we filed on the 2nd of October, which is Monday, and those are at docket numbers 235 and 236. And yesterday, very late, we filed a new version, which incorporated even more. You mean this morning? Yes. Yes. My days and nights are blending together. But yes, today you filed amended. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that correction, Your Honor. It was today at docket numbers 215 and 251. And we also filed a revised proposed conditional approval order this morning at docket number 252. And so with police accord, I'd like to provide an overview of the plan of disclosure statement before I turn to objections. Yes, that would be great. So, Your Honor, we believe that this updated disclosure statement contains adequate information that would allow parties, voting parties, to make an informed decision to vote or to adjust or accept the plan. Among other things, the disclosure statement provides information concerning the debtor's business, organizational structure, capital structure, the key events that led to these cases, as well as the major events that have happened thus far in the cases. It provides an overview of the plan, including the classification and treatment of claims and interests. It outlines the potential risk factors associated with the plan and also includes a liquidation analysis, demonstrating the difference between recoveries under this plan versus a hypothetical Chapter 7. That we filed a liquidation analysis today at docket number 253. Does Your Honor have a copy? I do. Okay. It also includes an explanation of the plan structure, including what I'll call the one and a half or two and a half hobbles, rather. So, specifically, there are a number of restructuring events that are possible under the plan. And the first is a sales transaction, which would be consummated outside of the plan for 2363. And then the plan administrator would then wind down the residual estate. There's 
itself to the possibility of a reorganization transaction where a third party makes a capital contribution in exchange for 100% of the equity interest of the reorganized debtors. And if those two fail or are not consummated, the plan would then toggle to a straight liquidation. The disclosure statement also included a description of specific capital releases under the plan. And just to sort of put that on the record, former directors and officers are not terminated parties under the plan. And with certain exceptions, current directors and officers are also not released parties. And those are current directors and officers are not released with respect to what we're calling 98F wallet causes of action or avoidance actions other than those related to ordinary course benefits and wages. But current directors and officers are exculpated under the plan. The disclosure statement also includes that the subcurrent fee qualifies as a releasing party as well as the opt-out procedures. And under those, all parties can opt out of the releases. The voting parties can check the opt-out box on the ballot. And the non-voting creditor list includes a box as well. So those parties can either file a formal objection to the releases with the court or they can just check that box and return it to the claims agent. And of course, voting parties can also file formal objections with respect. Your Honor, turning to objections and informal comments, they fell into two buckets to my mind, disclosure objections and confirmation objections. And I believe we've resolved most, if not all, of the disclosure objections through language of the plan and the disclosure statement. The disclosure objections were focusing primarily on maintaining the status quo established under the final cash management order and including information regarding the debtor's investigation and when it will be completed and also available insurance. And the BPA changes to the extent we could to the plan disclosure statement. And I'll just put into the record where they are. In the disclosure statement, it's section 6B4 and 786A and, sorry, it's 686A and 7A2 and as well as in article 2.4 of the plan. And I also believe there's something in 6.9. You think there's something what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. In article 6.9 of the plan as well. I think I've just gotten right before court. So, Your Honor, with respect to the detail that we provided about the investigation, I expect folks are going to be unhappy. They would like more. But what I'll say is that we are investigating the 98F wallet issues as well as the property of the estate issues as quickly as we can. These are very complicated issues. We are being as thoughtful as we can. And like I said, we're working as fast as we can. But either at this time we have nothing more to report than what's in the disclosure statement or we cannot report more because it would jeopardize the investigation. So what we've tried to do is balance the disclosures against where we are in the investigation. And in terms of when it will be completed, we are taking a very thoughtful, careful approach. So at this time I don't have an update as to when those matters will be completed, either one of them. But we're working as quickly as we can. We're putting 2004 notices. I believe we're going to file a 2004 motion today. Perhaps at some point in time so we can have it heard on the 18th. But this is our next hearing. So, you know, we're doing what we can. But we don't have a definitive outside date. And then the current... Let me ask you, if you discovered information that you could share, would you file like a supplement if you had it prior to the plan supplement? Yes, yes. If we have... I believe what I usually do in these cases is I file a sort of a supplement to the disclosure statement at the time of the plan supplement that explains the changes from the old disclosure statement that was solicited. And, of course, we only anticipate recovery being better, not worse, than it on file or that was going to be on file later today. So, yes, we would definitely do that, Your Honor. And the confirmation objections were really related to the scope of the releases, which we've been negotiating with the committee very closely. And, you know, the treatment of claims, specifically cryptocurrency and fiat currency and customer accounts, which is, you know, touching on the property of the estate issue, which, you know, we haven't settled on yet. 
And you know, with respect to confirmation judgments, it's our position that you know it's routinely a good preserve until the final hearing. We're not, nobody's being prejudiced by taking those off. And with that, with that, I'd like to walk your honor through Plaintiff Green Davis's refiling this morning, last early this morning, but I don't believe we have them. Okay, so perhaps. Well, maybe I should hear from objectors. I don't even know who's a live objection right now. I'm sorry, what? I don't even know who are live objections right now. I believe we have, I can run through what I believe has happened. I believe that we have resolved Allegheny Publishing's objection by including the other secured claim class, which was inadvertently left out. With respect to PP Labs, I believe we have resolved their disclosure objection by including language in 2.4 of the plan, but that they might want to just put something on the record with respect to their reservation of rights to confirmation. And plaintiffs with a joinder to PP Labs, I'm not sure. I think they still have concerns about the disclosures with respect to the investigation, as far as I know. And then Anchor Point, we've made a number of changes to the plan to address their concerns, and we did send the revised Fantasia to them before the hearing, but I have not heard from them one way or another, so I will keep the podium to anybody. Yeah, parties could just let me know where we stand. Well, I'd like to start with the objection, and then I'm assuming that you're in line with the debtor in the response. Okay, so why don't we hear from objectors? The committee can respond together with the debtor. And let's take an issue, you know, an objector at a time. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Marcia Dawson, Smith, Scott and Pepper, Hamilton Sanders, on behalf of Anchor Point. Anchor Point did file an objection at docket number 221, and specifically we raised three objections to the disclosure statement. Our first objection was that the initial disclosure statement didn't mention any of the resolutions reached in the final tax management order. There is language that has been added in 2.4 of the plan to address that the customers count for full fees for transfers. And so we might have a peek or two here or there in the plan, but we're still in active discussions with debtors counsel, and we're comfortable at this point in proceeding and just reserve on that for confirmation. Our second objection was that there wasn't adequate information with respect to claims that were being released for available insurance. The debtors did address the D&L insurance and added additional disclosures there, but with respect to estate claims that were being released, that's still an open issue from our perspective, which ties directly into our third objection, which is that the debtors' current directors and officers should not be released from any estate or third-party claims and causes of action. And it's our understanding from debtors counsel, as was previewed, that the debtors are proposing to release current directors and officers with respect to claims except for the defined non-release D&L claims. But the plan and disclosure statement we find are very confusing on this point. Nowhere in the definition of release parties are the current directors listed, but then the end of the definition says, quote, notwithstanding the foregoing, the directors and officers against whom the debtors hold non-release D&L claims as of the petition date shall not be release parties under the plan. But as noted, that definition of release parties only includes eight separate parties, and none of them are the current D&Os. So it's our position that the plan and disclosure statement needs to be amended to make clear exactly what releases the debtors are proposing to grant to current directors and officers, except with respect to those non-release D&L claims. And then coupling on to the end of this, the disclosure statement in our position lacks adequate information as to what value, what claims are being released for current D&Os, what the value of those claims are, as well as what the contribution is that the D&Os are making in exchange for those releases. We understand that there are ongoing investigations, but there's no other discussion of what these claims might be, what their value are, and it's really not adequate information to provide voting creditors with a reasonable understanding of what the plan is doing and make an informed judgment as to how to vote on the plan. Therefore, we would respectfully request that the court require an amendment to the disclosure statement to add sufficient information regarding what claims are being released 
have an estimated value and what contribution is being made in exchange. Um, and then just with respect to confirmation, we reserve the right um, to bring any confirmation objections to the, the third party and can discover releasers. Um, and with that, Your Honor, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, no, but I'd like to hear from the debtor or the committee the position. And I know you were just getting documents, so I don't know if you heard the end of that. Um, Your Honor, so a couple of things. Mr. Dennis, well, uh, Mr. Sullivan has told me that I may have misstated uh, the scope of the releases for the current directors and officers. They are not release parties with respect to 98 S wallet causes of action. I want to make that clear. Um, so I have the, the red lines now. Um, may I approach? The Certainly. Board? Is this just um, a black line of edits since this morning? Yes. Okay. Um, so, Your Honors, the in the disclosure statement, we added. Sorry, you can't record. Um, we added. Of the release party at six three three six and it says at the bottom, importantly, certain claims and causes of action are preserved against current officers and directors, directors and officers, subject to applicable limitations and the debtors do not propose to release former directors and officers under their plan. I went through what, and I think that it, the plan is clear in terms of who, what the release is that we're to. And I hate to jump around on this, but in the red line of the plan. The red line you just gave me? The black line of the plan. Okay, right, okay. Yes. The non-colored line. Um, the added language at the end of section uh, 6.9 that also describes you know, the scope of the releases and it covers that they're not being released except for, for avoidance actions, except for ordinary course wages. And it's not, article 6.9 is not intended to release or otherwise limit or modify claims of action against, um, against one of the officers. So, I, maybe I'm just too in the weeds, but I don't know that it's unclear. And um, we've tried to work with Interpoint to make it clear. I think we've made, maybe made like a dozen changes on their behalf. And uh, I just, I'll let the committee speak to this, but I'm not sure it's unclear. And the scope of, in terms of who is released, I think that's a confirmation issue. And that might change between now and then. So their rights with respect to that are, are preserved in my mind. And if, uh, when we get to the plan supplement stage, perhaps the solution would be to put a list of release directors and officers as part of the plan supplement. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Robert Sharp from Good afternoon. for Post Counsel for Creditors Committee. I'm going to do something a little bit at risk here. My partner's been doing the language. So I may get this wrong, and he will come up and tell me where I have it wrong. But I think these folks have not been sleeping. I think it's really important to understand is unlike so many other cases that we do here, where the releases are everyone and their affiliated people and then their affiliates and their affiliates and so on and so on, the releases that have been negotiated here are very, very, very narrow. Okay? And so what we're talking about in terms of what's easy in lots of other cases, everyone's released. Here, it's like almost no one's released. And whatever investigation is yielding will, whatever value is accreted as a result of that. And as Ms. Kandensky said, Mr. Nessie, I'm sorry, uh, said, if between now and we get to the plan supplement time, there's more information that's yielded, that will be made available to everyone. So it's the conversion, I think, of the fact that 
it's a little more complicated because it's a very few people that are being released that we trail the definition around to figure that out. But it's really the people who are working on the bankruptcy case. It's really the people who are on the special committee, right? Um, and not that much more. So are there people who are at the company and no longer there? No releases. Anybody related to the 98 equity? No releases. Any individual claims that creditors have? No releases. We can't really delineate all of those people because it's sort of everybody. It's almost, so I'm, I, I don't know if that's really where the confusion lies as to why somebody might say there's not enough disclosure. There is enough disclosure, it's that there's not a lot of leases going on here. And that's probably what, and I think that's what this new language, I'm just reading for the first time because we're working very fast. Right, I understand. Effectively says. Maybe, maybe Anchor Point Council, I think she just got opportunity to look at it. So maybe. Yes, certainly. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, excuse me. Does that resolve all of Anchor Coin's issues? Understanding that you're reserving rights for confirmation hearing. Your Honor, we do still think that there should be some uh, that there should be some more of a disclosure with respect to what claims are going to be released and the value and what contributions uh, to, for current and former directors, um, or just as current, excuse me, um, than just the one sentence that there's an investigation ongoing. I guess um, I'm a little concerned with the ongoing investigation. What would it be, what, what information would you contemplate could be provided that would answer your question in light of the fact that it's an ongoing investigation? I mean, I heard the point about that there, if there could be a supplement, there would be a supplement in advance of this. Um, well, I guess it was discussed as part of the plan supplement. I think that it would need to be somewhat in, in advance of the voting deadline. Um, um, don't worry, I have an issue with the, the <laughs> plan supplement date. It's not compliant with the local rules. So, and, um, and so I think that would give us some comfort, but I, I understand that there's confidentiality since there's an ongoing investigation, but there's really, there's really no basis for a creditor to read that one sentence and understand what they may or may not be giving up by accepting or rejecting the plan. Um, and so I think there just needs to be some kind of like middle ground. I mean, if say there's an investigation, I, I don't know what that means as a creditor and, and what my value might be at stake. And also on the flip side, what contribution is being made by, um, by a party supposed to be released related to that. Well, let me, I want to resolve the one outstanding issue here. Um, since we're kind of mid-objection. So is there any additional information that could be provided with respect to investigation? What happens if you have nothing available at the time of the confirmation hearing? That's, that's one of my overall arch, arching concerns here. And I appreciate 
um, comments that were made to me at the prior hearing about these types of cases um, lose money and they need to run on a parallel track. Um, but uh, as a consequence of that, you don't have the information that you might otherwise have available if you were waiting a couple of weeks. But I don't know if that means weeks or months or years for an investigation. Your Honor, I think that, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility in this case or other cases that an investigation goes into the post effective date timeline. Um, you know, we'll know what we'll have an update when we do the amended disclosure statement supplement. But um, you know, they can go two ways, right? We get access to the ninety eight F wallet or we don't. And with respect to the property estate issues, there's a number of different types of contracts that have different provisions, and we need to analyze all of those to determine whether you know we agree with uh, under a certain contract that there's not like it's not property estate, or whether we want to bring it to your honor um, for for you to decide whether it's property estate based on our analysis. So those motions will be coming. Um, you know, we are starting. We've been active in the 2004 process. We'll be serving those 2004 motions and bringing as much as we can to your honor to decide before confirmation. But uh, we, there's a mechanism set up in the plan so that if those continue, there'll be somebody to carry that on post-effective date. But uh, before, by the time we get to confirmation, though, we will know which type of transaction we have and you know what the value is of that transaction. So we will have additional information for creditors, but I can't commit to a timeline on the investigation piece. Please. Your Honor, I think it's fundamental, it's important to understand the fundamental nature of this plan as compared against other plans for disclosure purposes today. And this is not a reorganizing company plan. We are not rehabilitating a business and going in and issuing screens and delivering stock to people and hoping for the best. This is a sale of a non-operational business, and that may be the path, it may be a different path. This is a transitional plan. This is a plan that takes where we are in bankruptcy with all this administrative expense, with all of the burden on your honor's docket, and says, let's wrap it up, tie it up, and wind it down according to what value created going forward. I view those as more transitional plans, okay? The nature of disclosure in the former matter, the typical rigid reorganization is, what am I getting, how am I getting it, what is it worth, what can I do with it, right? In that scenario, if I'm getting stock, if I'm getting beneficial interest in a liquidation trust, if there's gonna be causes of action, of course, you wanna know exactly what it is I'm getting, how I'm getting it, what it's worth. When you're in a transitional plan, where we're using the means of chapter 11 to wrap up in a very cost-effective, efficient, and value accretive for the creditors, and we don't yet know those things, I, I respectfully, Your Honor, nobody knows what's in it, how it's gonna be, where it's gonna go, because that's not the nature of the plan, that's not the fundamental nature of our case. We can't lick our fingers, stick it up in the air, and know how these things go, because we don't know the answer to those questions, and sit there and say, well, we can't get a disclosure statement approved, and people won't know how to vote on whether or not wrapping it up is the better way to go. I don't think that's what 1125 does in this context. Granted, in other contexts, but that's not us here. Your Honor, I had a few words that I wanted to say about it, about the plan and what we're doing today, but I wanted to address that particular issue. Okay. Is it now a good time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. The committee's position for purposes of today, we filed a reservation of rights. Um, and we are, we have no issue with the relief requested by the debtor today. And in saying that, I, I want to acknowledge something too. These folks have worked awfully hard. And they have met us um, more than halfway to, to accommodate the committee's informational needs, um, negotiating requests, make concessions, achieve uh, uh, a deal that I think from a plan perspective we're almost there. Okay, I'm incredibly thankful and I'm honored to have worked with them because they did a great job. Um, and, and the board as well, for the professionals especially. We're not today on board with the plan. 
And that's not that there are things in the plan that are making us uncomfortable. It's that this case is moving extremely quickly for reasons that have to do with, as I just mentioned before, we're not reorganizing the adult family business, we're running a sale process and we're wrapping up the case. But it's kind of the, um, the old novel theory below the surface of the water, you know? You can write, you write a good novel, it's only a little bit leaky, but it's below the surface. It, this is complicated. This is a complicated case. And this company historically operated in a complicated and important way in a rather lot of that deep justice in one. We're trying to get to all of that stuff here. Um, and there's an M&A process going on. We think we're gonna be supported, and we think that we'll be in a position to announce that support very quickly, days, a week or two. Um, but we're not there just today. We have some time down there. We have to do this yet. Um, we provided debtors council with a draft of a letter of support. You know, the typical creditors committee letter of support. I do not believe it's been presented here on this for approval. My understanding of the way that we've been operating under this is that, first off, we, I don't have authority to release that letter or authorize the debtor to release it to creditors just yet. We're working to achieve that. Um, um, and I understand from the debtor's perspective that their view would be that the letter, since they have signed off, I believe, on the letter form, um, would be acceptable from their perspective. I just don't want to be in an 1125 mm -hmm. um, risk of having either we submit that letter directly or the debtor do it without your honor having the opportunity to do it. I've certainly been involved in cases before many judges in Delaware where it was fine as long as the debtor approved it, it didn't need um, judicial imprimatur, but I, I don't want to be that procedure was processed at Wall Street Honor. Um, if you would like to, if you I'd like to review it before it goes uh, excuse out. Excuse me, Your Honor. I'd like to review it before it goes out. Certainly. With that, Your Honor, any questions for me? I don't. Not now. Thank you. Your Honor, I wasn't sure if we had the final version of that no, letter. That's um, so, if Mr. Stewart um, wants to file it, let him know. I have his name. Yeah, but it's not. Is it once you finalize? I don't. Yeah, I don't want to see it until. Because I understand the committee hasn't approved it yet, correct? Uh, we, we, I believe the committee has approved the form of the letter, but we're not yet in a position to announce that we're publicly supporting, right. so we have some things that we have to do first. Um, assuming that we get to that point, then we would, I would be authorized to tender it to the debtors for participation or otherwise publicize it. But if Your Honor wants, it believes that, and we think that makes a lot of sense, should we do it under sort of a certification of counsel or, or Notice. Oh, a notice is fine. Okay, and then um, as long as we well, want to be sure that it, whatever order we're, we're doing or today would enable. I'm a little bit confused procedurally. I notice it up, or do I file a motion for a motion for further relief and prosecution? Your Honor, if, if you're inclined to approve the letter, we can include it as an order by the proposed form of order as an exhibit. Yeah, I just want to see it. Um, yes, let's walk through them, and I understand that Anchor Coin still has an open issue, but let's walk through the change yet. So PC filed the Chapter 11 plan uh, early this morning. We've made a number of changes for the committee and corrections as well. Um, the first one is in Okay.
seem like one point five four. And uh, it would seem like one point eight seven would be two. And eight nine. Bear with me just a second. Maybe there's a policy that needs to stay with, you know, with the buyer. Or, um, you know, if the if the buyer, if the cash provided by the buyer satisfies all of the claims, um, they should be able to retain the ninety-eight wallet with access. Things like that. So, just to sort of caveat it, make sure that it's not we're not, you know, misrepresenting. Number 1.168 is another hidden key for you to see briefly. And uh, 2.4, these are, these are cleanup changes. Um, we have made a number of changes before the hearing, this uh, paragraph, uh, to resolve further objections, um, including with respect to the status quo piece regarding um, the ad and cryptocurrency and customer accounts. So these are we added transfer to this for anchor point so that it was clear that it really did maintain the status quo because transfer was also covered in that final confirmation order. Uh, Article 3.6, these are changes by the committee which we agreed to. And then um, if you turn to the next page, you're going to see in each class of clean of um, each of the, the subclasses in class three, the general unsecured creditors. Um, we've added at the, the um, committee's request this sort of subparagraph E, which I, my understanding is if um, some cash or cryptocurrency is allocated to a particular subclass, if it's not used, they can reshuffle that into another class, which we thought was appropriate. Who, who described I mean, I understand what the papers say, but on a more granular level, who are the creditors in the, the three classes, the cl class three and its subclasses? So the, the it's the general unsecured creditors right. for the debtor, each debtor, and it's the trade creditors and their customers. Right. So it's do, are there many trade creditors, or is this primarily customers? I think it's just the the amount of trade debt and, and customer debt. It's Can, before you get there, 
Um, can I just ask you, because we're here, what, explain to me the convenience class, so class in, four. So in Learn, is that we have a number, a large amount actually of claims that are very small, and we give a lot of creditors that come in have very small claims, and we wanted to give them the opportunity to select, elect to have this convenience class where they, they can get their money faster, they don't have to participate in the claims reconciliation process or anything like that, and we thought that given sort of the nature of crypto and the, the, the diverse cryptocurrency holder body, um, that this might be attractive to people with lower like base claims. But it doesn't, does it identify the amount? Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I must have missed um, it. And maybe it's a definition. Uh, no, I think it's just not in this. Yes, that's three hundred dollars. Oh, okay. And just for context, that there's you know more than twenty twenty thousand claims that we need to eliminate uh, through that mechanism. So, of course, the administrative costs of not getting it that seem to go by. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, I think you're at six point six, maybe. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just briefly at the top. Uh, in a prior version, we had given the creditors committee pretty broad consent rights, um, and including with respect to uh, potentially adverse tax consequences to their constituents. And what we've added here is um, that well, like we added that we can't reduce any of the consent rights under the plan, even though we can grant them more. We can't pull them back. of non-reduced DNL claims to include um, you know, causes of action related to uh, redemption of equity by the debtors. Um, I don't have a, a lot of detail on, on it, but um, we agreed that that would be appropriate. And so a lot of these changes are to clarify that and also to, um, at the end of that paragraph, to talk about what we discussed today with respect to the proposed action for directors and officers. with um, on 41 and page 46 another one of the cleanup on um, right about 6.16 is more cleanup and then 6.16 is <coughs> modified to you know explain to cover all insurance policies not just the inner policy Um, we originally had the debtors and creditors committee identify it as the causes of action and ask that we take that out and we were okay with that. In 9.6, um, the changes to the prior um, insurance section I just discussed obviated the need for this. So we just agreed to delete them. And those are all the changes to the plan for today. Okay. Yes, please. So many of these changes might be um, just implementing the changes I just discussed. So I'll, I'll skip over those. So I guess that brings us all the way to 
which is um, I discussed earlier about we put in an explanation of the releases and exculpations in the disclosure statement to try and address underlying concerns so that you know people didn't have to parse through all the definitions. with me a second. Um, on page 87, I think of the, each of the relief professionals is duplicative of the preceding page, bullet point six. Um, oh, they're exculpated. I'm sorry. No, 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 I, that was my misreading, sorry. It's what happens when you publicly read things. Okay. I do not. Um, actually, I don't really want to discuss the order until we go through objections. Okay. And um, I also would like an explanation on the liquidation analysis because I don't understand it. And I understand that that's for another day in terms, but I need to determine that this is, that I don't have a feasibility issue that would preclude solicitation. And maybe we should just wait till we hear from an objector. Um, but at some point, I'm going to want to hear from it or on it. But I want to hear from objectors first. So um, I think where we left off with respect to objections was Anchor Coin um, still having an open issue. Um, with respect to what was being disclosed with respect to investigation. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, Your Honor. Um, so I was hinting at it today. Text message went out last week. I do think that the changes to, uh, I think it's ID 6.9, changing the carve out from the current debtors, current directors and officers being released for only the 90 active wallets causes of action to the broader all claims and causes of action. Um, going through that just now is very helpful to see uh, more specifically. So it, my understanding then is that the only thing the current directors and officers are being released for is the ordinary course of these avoidance actions. And so with that, Your Honor, I think you can stand down on the need more information on the investigation because those investigations are not being released. Okay. And is that, that her understanding is correct? Again, they are, again, they are exculpated. Well, <laughs> so I guess then it is, it does kind of bring 
goes back to how do we know what the creditors are agreeing to release or not release if it's a toggle they don't release. Have any insight into what, what steps the investigation is or what things were just gathered for the first time along those lines. And then I'm sorry, Mr. Stark, I can't hear you. You want Oh, oh, are you talking? Oh, do you need a minute? No, no. no. Oh. So, so he was asking if it was related to the release of the exculpation items. Did the exculpations related to, you know, post-petition activities? That's not our concern. Uh, our concern is with re the release. Um, and hearing that if the investigation shows that a, a current director and officer is not liable for a 98X wallet cause of action, I think it comes back to our you know, our client and other creditors concern of how do we know what that investigation entailed, what causes and claims of action were looked at and evaluated and found to not be liable for if, you know, we're agreeing to accept the claim that, that would release them before we know the outcome of what steps were taken. Yes, please. There's no release here. All that's happening is a channel to insurance. It's a mechanic that agreed to the many, 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 many of the plans that I've been involved in once has anybody said to me that has to delineate before any disclosure statement what and how in cases where the knowledge is ready and available we don't have to do that and we don't have the information ready and available people are voting as whether or not on the whole the deal is sufficient if you don't like the deal vote against it if you want to do something else let us know but there isn't information to add and no one's getting releases it's just if they're found liable it's done by the insurance not their own personal wallet. I, I don't think that's what the plan says, so though. My point was not that they're being released. It was that if they're not liable, if there's 98 X wallet receipts, then they're off the hook. That's all. They, you know, they shouldn't have, if, if it's decided that, you know, they weren't participating, had no knowledge, nothing with the, these issues, then they're, they're just not liable. It's not a release. It's just we that we're tightly bound. You're saying under the plan, they are not released. Right. If there's subsequent litigation post effective date and they are found not liable, it is what it is. Exactly. But they are not getting a release. No. Other objectors? Your Honor, John Weiss uh, of Patchman Stein, Walter Hayden, on behalf of both Tiki Labs, Inc. and Allegheny Casualty Company. Good afternoon, uh, with, Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Judge Nichols. Uh, the, uh, with respect to Allegheny Casualty, whom I'll speak for uh, today, and then I will uh, cede the podium to my co-counsel, Tracy Shaproff from the Keller Benvenuti Fund. With respect to Allegheny Casualty, uh, we appreciate the debtors adding the secured class to the plan. We do have issues that we'll have to address in connection with the plan with respect to overall treatment and collateral that we're holding, et cetera. Um, we anticipate continuing to work with the debtors. Those discussions have begun, and we'll simply reserve rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis plan issues uh, to be addressed at that time if necessary. And uh, other than that, if I could just turn the podium over, please, to my co-counsel, and uh, with, with that introduction, um, I believe she'll be speaking for Trace Tiki Labs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Ms. Schaffer? Did I Ms. Schaffer, that? thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry, pronounce that again? Uh, Tracy Schaffer. Okay, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, I'm with Keller Ben Benedetti Kim, LLP. Um, as Mr. Weiss uh, mentioned, we represent Tiki Labs Incorporated doing business as Audius Incorporated. Um, so we appreciate all of the work that the debtors have done to address the objections to the extent they can at this point in the disclosure statement, but we did want to make sure we pre preserved our rights with respect to those objections. Tiki Labs holds a significant amount of cryptocurrency in a customer custody account. And so the determination of non-estate assets and the account treatment issues are of paramount importance to Tiki. Um, we appreciate that the debtors added language making it clear that they would not take tokens subject to customer agreement without a court order. But at this point, without an understanding of the debtors, you know, the debtors have not taken a position yet on whether 
customer custody accounts or the cryptocurrencies in those accounts or estate property and how those will be treated. So without that information, Tiki Labs doesn't have adequate information to be able to make an informed vote on the plan. So at this point, we just want to make sure that we preserve Tiki Labs' rights to raise those objections to the adequacy of the information in conjunction with the final approval of the disclosure statement and the confirmation of the plan. Bear with me a second. Let me ask the debtors. I'm looking at Local Rule 3017-2. Objections not made at the time of the hearing on voting procedures form a notice and form a ballot aren't considered at the time of confirmation. Is it the debtor's position that Tiki can reserve its right with respect to customer accounts to the hearing at the confirmation hearing to address the adequacy of the disclosure statement? Yes, Your Honor. I would like to have an opportunity to see our supplements and then, you know, to the extent, and we'll work with them to take on that, but to the extent they're still not satisfied with the disclosures, it's our position that those are preserved. Okay. Does the U.S. Trustee have any issue with that position or this committee? As Joseph Cudio for the United States Trustee, yes, and again, I did want to thank Debtors' Council for working with us to get most of our issues resolved. As far as the disclosure statement issues, they are resolved. As far as we're concerned, we do want to reserve our rights as far as confirmation issues, which we do have some, but again, a lot of hard work on their part. Okay. But as to Tiki, the U.S. Trustee doesn't take a position whether those issues are reserved regarding adequacy of the disclosure statement? No, we're not taking a position. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. And Mr. Cudio, let me thank you. I can tell the U.S. Trustee had a hand in many of the modifications, and I appreciate that. Your Honor, as far as the committee is concerned, we're perfectly fine with the preservation of rights when it comes to the disclosure statement. Okay. All right. Were there any other issues with respect to Tiki? No, that was it, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, this is David Newman on behalf of Coinbex. I filed a joinder to Ms. Shafroth's objection. It was just very well written and really encapsulated the concerns that my client has. My client and its users are the owners of about a little over 100 bitcoins out of, I believe, a pool of 300 bitcoins that the debtors have under their trust, under various trust agreements. And our only concern is that we know that, as far as we can tell from the disclosure statement, that bitcoin, BTC, was never involved at all in this wallet issue. And so our concern is, without knowing the timing of the supplement and then knowing at least a statement as to where the matter is currently, just where the investigation is, is it ongoing, what stage it's at, it's really hard to get over our objections to the fact that our ownership in BTC and the process with regards to resolving the ownership issues as to BTC are not disclosed in any way in the disclosure statement as those BTC issues, the bitcoin issues, are unique to bitcoin holders. And as it doesn't seem like anything was, that any issues in this case affected the BTC, the BTC rights under the Fireblocks technology that was used to maintain wallets in this case. Let me hear from the debtors. Good morning, Your Honor. I think earlier that the debtors have not raised any issues with respect to any cryptocurrency, BTC or otherwise, and that's 
whether it's proper to be excluded, and that those are ongoing. I believe that Floyd has identified that as well. And that, you know, parties will have an opportunity to review a supplemental disclosure statement, which will have additional details. But at this time, I can't put more information in it than I have it. Mr. Stark, yes. And this will reiterate that we'll continue to work with all these parties to address these concerns between now and the final hearing. And to the extent they're not addressed to their satisfaction, we consider those to be preserved. That's sufficient for us, Your Honor. Okay. So I would encourage you to continue to talk, and your issue is reserved for the final hearing. We will, Your Honor. Are we with that? Would you like to turn to the order? No, actually. Sorry. And let me just reiterate to Mr. Newman, today's approval of a disclosure statement would be only on the interim basis. So it will be readdressed. Your Honor, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to appear before you. I do appreciate it. Certainly. I would like explanation. I appreciate liquidity. I mean, the liquidation analysis is not before me today. But I could not or did not understand, and I'm afraid I didn't bring it out here with me, how parties or creditors received more in an 11 than a 7 based on the analysis that was attached. With Your Honor's permission, I would ask Mr. Murphy to approach the podium and block it on the table. Okay. And could you just wait a second while I find the report that was actually provided? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I can't find my copy of the report. That's all. I'm just – just give me a second. Sorry. I have it. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. I don't – wait one second. Maddie. Can you give me a second? Sorry. Since he's the financial advisor, I'm going to have him sworn in. Okay. You can stand there, sir, but you're going to be sworn in. And could you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm your word that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the best of your knowledge and ability? Yes, Your Honor. And could you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record? William C. Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I had a question about the liquidation analysis because I don't appreciate how – I understand this says there would be – a creditor would receive more in 11 than a 7, but I don't understand based on the numbers that are attached. Particularly, I'm looking at the Chapter 11 orderly wind-down that's on page 13 of 14 versus the Chapter 7 liquidation that's on page 14 of 14, where it reflects an 81.4% recovery as a mid-case to Chapter 7. And yet, if I look at the Chapter 11 orderly wind-down, it breaks it out for customer claims, trade, convenience, contracts, and it seems to be a lesser percentage to me. I'd like to recalculate that, Your Honor. That's an error. 
Oh, okay, because I'm like, uh, uh, yeah. all right. You know what? Would it be helpful if we took a quick break? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. That would be very helpful um, because I didn't want to make a representation about something being patently unconfirmable if there's an error. So why don't we take um, 10 minutes? Okay. All right. Let's take a, we'll stand in recess for 10 minutes.
Okay. And uh, I'll explain it, but we'll file a, an updated, corrected version that goes into the disclosure statement that it will be solicited with your permission. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, the Chapter 11 orderly wind down uh, check, uh, column, mm -hmm. that is 68.2%. And the Chapter 7 liquidation column would be 66.9%. Wait, hold on one second. So, I'm sorry, I was writing with a dead pen. So it should be 68.2 with respect to Chapter 11 orderly wind down, and then with respect to Chapter 7 liquidation, it should be what? 66.9, that replaces what number? 81.4? Yes, um, I can't see it. <laughs> yes. Okay, just want to make sure. I was. So, oh, wait a minute. So it's 68.2 recovery under 11 and 81.4 under 7? No, so the 81.4 is not, I think that's, uh, no, that's not correct. It should be 66.9. And the 70% oh. is convenience class uh, in 11, which is right above it. So the 81.4 6.9, so it's the differential between 68.2 and 66, so it's a 2% differential. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarity. I appreciate it. Let me ask before we proceed any further, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard with respect to the solicitation motion, the disclosure statement, or the proposed form of order? Okay, I hear none. Let's proceed forward with the order. Thank you, Your Honor. So this is based on the, we haven't made any changes to the version we filed for you this morning. Okay. And um, has Your Honor had a chance to review those, or would you like us to walk through? Do you want to walk through? I did review them. Bear with me a second. I have a lot of paper. I have a preemptive well, I have my comments typed out, so I might have to work with you a little bit on what paragraph because the, when the revised was filed, it changed the page numbers, and I made my comments last night, but I did look at it this okay. morning, what was filed. Yeah, do you know the docket number? Uh, I'm just going to pull it up right now. So I. It's 252, and the red line starts at, it's 252-2. Okay. I think this will be probably more efficient. <coughs> so I can tell you as probably the biggest issue that I have, and it's going to change a lot of things, is that the schedule doesn't work because of two fundamental things. <laughs> One, November 10 is a court holiday. The court is closed. I no, it's okay. And as a consequence, I, the earliest I can schedule something is November 14 at 1 o'clock. Okay. So that's going to kind of trigger some date changes. But the other um, fundamental issue I had is that I am – I'm going to require compliance with the local rule regarding the plan supplement. This is a very big issue often expressed by the United States Trustee's Office that plan supplements have to be in seven days, the earlier of the deadline to vote or the deadline to reject a plan. 
And in this case, it's just, it's too close. It would have to be, your plan right. supplements, if you maintain this schedule, it's going to have to be filed by October 27th. Right, and that's exactly where we landed. Oh, okay, so, terrific. Um, in the, in the break, during the break, we landed up using that as a point of settlement. Um, the, the hearings on the 14th, that might shift down a bit, just to, you know. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to keep it. Um, so if we have a hearing on the 14th, I'm working back up, but if you have the hearing at 14, the 14th at 1, your agenda is going to be due the 9th, at noon, mm -hmm. so your brief declarations, et cetera, have to be the 8th at 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you want to work. I think so. The only other question I had, and, and I can be convinced on this, but the debtor in this case, okay, so the bar date hasn't occurred yet, right? I mean, it, we have a bar date, but it has expired. and. The debtor just filed, or I entered an order, allowing the filing of the schedules as late as October um, 10th. Your Honor, we did file our schedules. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, so 3018 is not going to be an issue then. I had a concern with 3018, and I had a concern with tabulation. So they are. I don't remember when, because it seems like it was a million years ago. <laughs> okay. All right. I didn't check. I just knew I entered an order that provided for a later date. Okay. All right, so with respect to the order itself, let me, I want to, I didn't know if you need to update the intro to address your revised documents. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, Oh, that would be terrific. Plan, so we'll include those docket numbers just to make everything a little bit easier here. So let me get your most recent order. Do you know the docket number? I think you just said it. Of the most recent, oh, of the order? Mm -hmm. 1552? Mm -hmm. We also have a copy of the original plan. Oh, that would be great. Oh, it, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> I know you all have been working really hard. This is the most colorful black line I think I've ever seen. And it obviously reflects a lot of work going into it. Um, okay, so I didn't you know if you need to update. I think you do say amended, as amended or supplemented, so probably not necessary. Um, when... Paragraph A, I'm going to make, I'm not making any change to the order. I'm just telling you on the ballot, voting ballots, I'm going to ask you to make a modification. But I'll wait till we get there. Um, so paragraph 3, have to modify the confirmation hearing date. You're going to have to modify dates in paragraph 4, the disclosure statement, um, objection and plan objection deadline. Paragraph Six, no change needed, but I am going to, like I said, make an edit to the balance, um, ballots, excuse me. The confirmation schedule, as we just discussed, as long as you update to reflect the plan supplement date and the actual hearing date. Okay, um, 
paragraph 10, how are solicitation materials with respect to the voting class are primarily email, correct? Right, right. Okay, so my question is, and I know this is really granular, but is this going to be a single email with PDFs in it, or is it going to be like multiple PDFs attached to a file? And and the, my thinking here goes to the ballot, and we'll get to that in a minute. Like, is Okay. All right. That. They're also going to be hyperlinked in the notices. Oh, so they'll get both? Yeah. So they'll be hyperlinked, and we are, um, in some of the exhibits to the order, we had a hyperlink um, in, to the rest of the U.S. Postal Notice. Um, due to cost, um, they wanted us to list out to the relief parties that in a lot of places, and we did in a lot of Oh. All, all we have to do is click on it, and then they can see all of the releases, and there'll be a PDF that go, that they can that'll be, they'll be sent directly to that, which just has the releases, and there'll be one that just has the speculation. Okay. And is there a hyperlink? Like, if you want to do electronic balloting, you can do it. Yeah. Like, okay. All right. Um, in paragraph 11, and I know we discussed this at, at the um, last hearing about return email and mailing. I would just ask that there be a commercially reasonable effort to resend a ballot that comes back. And paragraph 12, we'll have to update. Well, I guess it's now paragraph 13, the voting deadline. Mm -hmm. And paragraph 14, you just answered the question I had. Um, 15, I don't know if your voting declaration deadline is going to change with the change of the hearing date. It'll, it'll be the reply deadline change. And the same, um, just so you know, there are two paragraph 15s in this order. When it was black lined, it wasn't before. It just became that, that way this today. And so we, it may just reflect that way on the black line, but I'll keep an eye out. yeah. Um, and of course, the plan supplement date is going to have to change. All right, here's my comment with respect to the ballot, and this is my last comment. I permit um, opt out. And, but I'm always concerned that it be obvious early in the ballot, not on page seven or eight, that there's an opt-out contained within the document. So I just think there should be a more prominent disclosure of the release opt-out on the front of the ballot. Okay. And I don't know if it goes in the title. I'll leave it to your discretion, but I want it to be obvious. And then um, on the ballots, and I appreciate that's in the notice, and the reason I mean, that's the reason I ask about how this was being presented in an email. But with respect to the ballots, the release language is in here, but not the definition. But I think you're telling me now that you edit it for that. Okay. And All right. With the timeline, one of the comments from one of the police officers was that we put the the chart with all the dates and deadlines in uh, the confirmation hearing notice. And uh, given our you know, cost concerns, um, we suggested a hyperlink to that schedule as well, in, in lieu of doing that. And for the per and for purposes of the record, these are people who have chose to do business with the debtor via email. 
Mr. Cudia, do you have, does the U.S. trustee have any issue with this process? Um, no, Your Honor. Okay. Um, does anyone else wish to be heard with respect to the form of order and the comments we just addressed? Okay. Having not heard any comments, I'm satisfied the debtors carried its burden and the relief sought in the motion is appropriate, um, subject to the modifications that we discussed here this afternoon, specifically in accordance with the local rules 3017-2. Um, I will grant the motion and approve the disclosure statement on an interim basis um, with the reservations that were set forth on the record today. Um, the solicitation procedures to be utilized, the form of notice, the confirmation hearing and ballots, and approve the revised schedule. So if you could submit that under certification of counsel, um, we'll get it approved. Yes, Certainly. All right, thank you all. I appreciate um, everyone's time this afternoon. And let me, I do appreciate this has been very fluid and I understand the amount of work that went into this and I do appreciate the parties working together. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. We stand adjourned.